On this vote, the yeas are 216, the nays are 210. The resolution is adopted. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The Office of Speaker of the House of the United States House of Representatives is hereby declared vacant. Hi there, thanks for joining us. I'm Michael Schnell. For the first time in history, the House of Representatives voted to remove the Speaker of the House. A group of Republicans, led by Florida Congressman Matt Gates, yanked the top job in the House away from Kevin McCarthy. House Republicans Andy Biggs, Ken Buck, Tim Burchett, Eli Crane, Bob Good, Nancy Mace, and Matt Rosendale joined Gates and Democrats in the vote to oust McCarthy. Just hours later, McCarthy announced he would not run for speaker again. I do not regret negotiating. Our government is designed to find compromise. I don't regret my efforts to build coalitions and find solutions. I was raised to solve problems, not create them. So I may have lost a vote today, but as I walk out of this chamber, I feel fortunate to have served the American people. I leave the speakership with a sense of pride, accomplishment, and yes, optimism. Congressman Patrick McHenry of North Carolina, an ally of former Speaker Kevin McCarthy, is now the temporary speaker. McHenry will preside over the House for the time being, which will include the election of the next speaker, likely next week. In this role, McHenry can only recess the House, adjourn the chamber, and recognize speaker nominations. House reporter Emily Brooks joins us now with what we can expect. After a chaotic day in the House and former Speaker Kevin McCarthy being ousted from the position, Patrick McHenry of North Carolina is the acting interim speaker. Uh, he is a representative from North Carolina, longtime ally of McCarthy. The reason why he is the acting speaker right now is there was a process instituted after 9-11 for continuity of government reasons where the speaker will designate a list of a couple people to act in his place if there's ever a vacancy. And so his sole responsibility right now is just looking at the House, managing it as they work through the business of electing a new speaker, because until then, there's not really much that the House can do until there is a new speaker. So he has called uh, for no votes for the rest of the week. And then on Tuesday, the House Republican Conference will be meeting to hear candidates talk about why they should be speaker. And then on Wednesday, they will elect or try to elect a new speaker. And exactly what's going to happen in those intervening periods, and even next week, is all up in the air. Members are very unsure about the path forward right now. As far as the candidates for who could be the next speaker, Republicans have a lot to choose from. The most obvious choice is House Majority Leader Steve Scalise. He has announced that he is, in fact, seeking the speakership. He has already been making calls to members to gain that support. He has a lot of experience in the infrastructure that comes with that. Uh, but he also is battling blood cancer right now, getting treatment for that. Uh, he, but, of course, he's still running. Even despite that, he has said it is a very treatable form of blood cancer. And with that, House Majority Whip Tom Emmer is not running for speaker, but instead seeking to move up in leadership, endorsing Scalise for the speakership, and then seeking to be majority leader. Uh, so there's going to be perhaps a shift in leadership there. But the wild card is other candidates who are not in leadership right now. Uh, Jim Jordan of Ohio, that first firebrand chair of the House Freedom Caucus when it was created, is also running for speaker. He said that he thinks he can be the best coalition candidate, consensus candidate for the House, and he would be a more hardline conservative pick for Republican members than Steve Scalise. And so that could be the biggest battle. There are other names in the mix as well, as well as Kevin Hearn of Oklahoma, who is chair of the Republican Study Committee, which is a conservative caucus in the House. A bunch of other names being thrown out as well, including Jody Narrington of Texas, Mark Green of Tennessee. Uh, there's just a lot of uncertainty, and members right now are looking for either 
they're looking for either their speaker candidates to tell them how they would achieve fiscal responsibility, and some of them actually want a rule change as a condition of their support for speaker to make it so just one person cannot call to oust the speaker and avoid this chaos in the future. All right, Emily Brooks at the Capitol, thank you very much. And now the fallout from Kevin McCarthy's ouster has, of course, shaken up the lower chamber. But senators have been also watching the rebellion against Kevin McCarthy unfold from the sidelines. And some of them are displeased with their colleagues in the House and lamenting the motion to vacate. Here's some reaction from Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. Yesterday, a small band of MAGA extremists plunged Congress into pandemonium. For the first time in American history, a Speaker of the House of Representatives has been removed from his position at the hands of radicals that he empowered from day one. What happened yesterday is a failure entirely of the House Republicans' own doing, a disaster in the making to the great detriment of Congress and to the detriment of the American people. Perhaps the most telling thing about this week's events in the House has been the way the speaker handled them, with grace and with gratitude. Speaker McCarthy should be proud of what he and his team have accomplished on behalf of the American people over the past nine months. And he can rest assured that his colleagues, myself included, will continue to draw on his talents and optimism in the days that lie ahead. Joining us now with more perspective on all that is Hill reporter Al Weaver. Uh, senators are really alarmed at what's going on on the House side with the Speaker's fight lately, and they are really alarmed for a number of reasons. Number one, Senate Republicans are really concerned uh, that it just shows that their party is unable to govern. The Senate Republicans are trying to keep things on the right track as far as spending and another, another, another of other issues. But it's really the House GOP is giving them issues with how, showing how they can govern, how they should be given responsibility to lead the parties in the future, especially with the presidential contests and consequential races in the Senate and House side next year. Uh, Senate Republicans are really worried about the optics and how this looks and how the Senate and the House can operate in the future. Uh, second side is Senate Democrats and, and some Republicans are still really alarmed on what this means for Ukraine aid. Uh, Ukraine aid obviously was left out of the last uh, uh, continuing resolution that was passed over the weekend to help fund the government and avoid a government shutdown. Um, but what this means moving forward is, is really a mystery. Will, will the future speaker, will they be pro-Ukraine aid, will they rec or will they reflect this growing uh, chatter in the, in, in the House GOP conference? on whether or not to help whether or not to help Ukraine. That's a major question the senators are looking to have answered. And the other thing looking ahead is in 45 days is when the new is when there's a government spending uh, package that needs to come through. Uh, obviously McCarthy kind of stuck his neck out on the line and literally had it chopped off this time around. Uh, but will uh, whoever the speaker is in a couple of in a month and a half will they want to do that also? It's highly unlikely. Uh, it's a real question on whether they can get a full year funding package done, uh, because obviously House Republicans, some of them do not want another continuing resolution. So how the future, uh, the, the future of spending, uh, the spending process on Capitol Hill, that's really in limbo. Uh, so all in all, the Congress faces a big issue when it comes to how the uh, picking, picking another speaker and where the Congress goes from there. All right, Al Weaver from the Capitol, thanks so much. And Congressman Kevin McCarthy's forced vacancy from the speakership is not only creating chaos in Congress, but also for the White House. President Biden has signaled that he hopes the House will move expeditiously to, con to choose a permanent speaker as a number of policies could remain in limbo, including the United States' continued support for Ukraine. Here to elaborate more on the administration's reaction to Republican rabble-rousers in the House is Brett Samuels, The Hill's White House correspondent. Brett, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Michael. Hey, so just to start off, I want to ask, you know, what has been the reaction from the White House, from President Biden, on this ouster of Kevin McCarthy? Of course, President Biden and McCarthy had worked in the past, particularly with that debt limit deal. So what's the White House and the president saying now? 
Yeah, well, like you said, you know, I think that the president and the speaker, or the former speaker now, uh, they certainly had a working relationship, even if it wasn't a cozy relationship. Uh, we've seen the White House, they sort of wanted to, to keep their hands out of any kind of discussion about whether uh, Democrats should either save McCarthy or back this motion to vacate. And similarly, we're seeing them kind of staying on the sidelines as the House tries to work through uh, who should be the next speaker after Kevin McCarthy. Uh, you know, they don't want to kind of wade into that. All they've said so far is that they are willing to work with whoever the next speaker is. And we heard President Biden just a little bit ago from the White House say, uh, you know, that the dysfunction in the House does concern him. So I think that the White House is sort of uh, maybe not nervously, but sort of, you know, they're, they're certainly carefully watching uh, what is going to play out in the House in the coming days and weeks. And look, when we talk about the relationship between President Biden and Speaker McCarthy, they did strike that debt limit deal back over the summer. Uh, President uh, Speaker McCarthy, then Speaker McCarthy, did put that clean continuing resolution on the floor to avert a government shutdown. So they did have some success in their relationship. But very notably, uh, Kevin McCarthy essentially had his committee chairs mark up appropriations bills at levels lower than the caps that were set in that debt limit deal, which was seen by a number of Democrats on Capitol Hill as walking away from that deal, reneging on the agreement. Is there any sense, do you have any sense that the White House is, is maybe happy to see McCarthy go, considering, you know, a, a number of Democrats have said that he's untrustworthy, pointing to that debt limit deal that he walked away from just a couple days after it was signed into law? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, I think on the one hand, obviously, the White House does not like to see the House uh, in sort of chaos and in dysfunction. They certainly don't like sort of the uncertainty that comes with it with uh, just basically 40 days at this point to fund the government uh, beyond this continuing resolution that was passed. And they don't like sort of the uncertainty around Ukraine aid, which Al talked about. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, you know, they, the White House has been very adamant in the last couple of weeks as Congress seemed to sort of hurdle toward a shutdown. The White House has been very adamant that they made an agreement with Speaker McCarthy, with then Speaker McCarthy uh, earlier this year, and that they were frustrated that he appeared to be reneging on that deal, going back on what they had agreed to. Uh, so certainly, while I think that the White House does not like seeing uh, the House just in shambles, basically, um, you know, there definitely was a sense of frustration that the two sides had reached an agreement and that this was on McCarthy, that he was sort of creating his own mess by going back on the deal that they had reached. And then you mentioned the issue of Ukraine aid, so did Al, which I think is going to be a really central part of conversations for the rest of the year. Uh, there was some uh, uh, signaling that uh, Kevin McCarthy was going to put uh, aid for Ukraine on the floor this week. That was sort of what House Democratic leadership over the weekend had signaled. Of course, now Kevin McCarthy's out of a job, out of his leadership job. And a, a catalyst that sort of led to this ouster at the end of the day was Matt Gates had claimed there was a, a quote, secret side deal on Ukraine between Speaker McCarthy and President Biden. Uh, Speaker McCarthy has Speaker McCarthy rejected that uh, notion, just saying that it was a technicality that had to do um, with the Ukraine aid that was included in the CR. So I wanted to ask you, A, what is the White House saying about this supposed secret side deal? I think it's significant because, again, Gates brought his motion to vacate hours after giving a speech about this deal. Uh, so, A, what is the White House saying about that? And then, B, you mentioned it right there. The White House is it must be concerned about being able to get Ukraine aid over the finish line in the coming months because, you know, we don't know who the speaker is going to be. And clearly there's not an appetite, a, a, an, an overwhelming appetite in the Republican conference. Definitely. You know, to, to sort of take the first point uh, that you mentioned, this idea of whether there was this side deal or some kind of negotiation happening uh, between the White House or an agreement between the White House and uh, Kevin McCarthy. You know, President Biden, in the aftermath of this continuing resolution being passed over the weekend, gave remarks in which he sort of alluded to some kind of, uh, you know, agreement that he had with McCarthy, basically saying that uh, he trusted McCarthy because they had made some kind of deal on Ukraine. Uh, but then the White House would not sort of specify or elaborate on whether there was some kind of concrete agreement. Uh, you know, so essentially it, it was left sort of just hanging there. And I think that that gave an opening to somebody like Matt Gates to essentially interpret it as some kind of side deal, even though it was never really clear that there was anything beyond just a hope from the White House that Kevin McCarthy would bring Ukraine aid up for a vote because there is this sort of bipartisan support for additional Ukraine aid. Uh, so certainly that is still a, a bit of a fuzzy area, but it's one that 
was definitely a catalyst, like you mentioned, for, for Kevin McCarthy's ultimate ouster. Um, you know, looking ahead, as you said, I think Ukraine aid is going to be a big point of concern for the White House, um, for a lot of lawmakers on Capitol Hill. Uh, as Emily mentioned, some of these candidates who are, who are being floated as the potential next speaker of the House in the Republican side, uh, not all of them are necessarily pro-Ukraine. Uh, some of them have been rather outspoken, Jim Jordan, for example, uh, in sort of resisting or opposing, just continuing to, to put up votes for additional Ukraine aid. Uh, but this is something that the White House has been very outspoken about. We heard President Biden just today say that he's going to give a speech in the coming days, basically laying out sort of the importance of continued U.S. support for Ukraine. Uh, the White House believes that this is something where there are lawmakers on both sides and both chambers of Congress that, that really support uh, aid for Ukraine and sort of fighting off Russia uh, during its invasion of Ukraine. Uh, so we'll see where it lands, but certainly this is an area where I think the White House, it's fair to say, is, uh, is a little anxious to see how this all plays out because depending on how the speaker race plays out, looking ahead, uh, that could definitely further hinder uh, their hopes to to secure uh, what they're looking for, which at this point is about twenty four billion dollars in military and humanitarian aid for Ukraine, uh, on top of what they've already funded. Yeah, and in addition to Ukraine, another key topic and issue in story when you talk about this intersection between Congress and and the White House is, of course, the impeachment inquiry into President Biden. That Speaker McCarthy unilaterally opened last month. He did that after saying he would hold a vote to open the inquiry, then went back on that word and ended up just launching it on his own accord. So I spoke to Congressman Garrett Graves earlier today, a Republican from Louisiana, a close McCarthy ally, and he was essentially saying that uh, not having a speech Speaker, which essentially shut, basically shuts down business or most of business in the House, will have some sort of effect on the impeachment inquiry. So I'm curious, does, is the White House aware that this could sort of slow down uh, House Republican efforts on impeachment? And are they planning any messaging or have you seen any messaging yet on sort of the chaos in the House and, and this, this having no speaker and scrambling and to find a leader on the backdrop of, hey, they're also going forward with an impeachment inquiry that has been highly criticized by the White House? Yeah, well, you mentioned it, but chaos is sort of like the buzzword. I think it's fair to say for the White House when they're talking about House Republicans in particular. Uh, we've seen, especially over the past week, which is basically when this impeachment inquiry, the first hearing took place was last week. Uh, but over the past week or so, we've seen the White House really try to hammer home this idea of a split screen, quote unquote, uh, this idea that on one side of Pennsylvania Avenue, you have House Republicans sowing what the White House believes is chaos with uh, this impeachment inquiry, which they believe the White House believes is baseless, uh, with sort of the the intraparty fighting over who should be in charge, uh, and then on the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue, the White House is happy to sort of project uh, this idea of competence uh, that President Biden is continuing to work for the American people, that they're going to roll out policy wins around uh, you know lowering prescription drug costs, uh, marking the anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, and we'll see in the coming days again, as I mentioned, you know, likely a speech from from the president on continued support for Ukraine. We saw today he talked about student debt relief. Uh, so this is a contrast that the White House is is happy to hammer home. And I think you know the absence of a speaker and the fact that the sort of Republicans eating their own at this point uh, just kind of feeds into that. And the White House is going to be happy to elevate that uh, and and continue to talk about that that contrast. All right, Brett Samuels. Brett Samuel, White House correspondent for The Hill, thank you so much. Thanks. Now, McCarthy was booted from the speakership after just under nine months on the job. Actually, the day that he was ousted was the first day of that January speaker's race, so not even a full nine months. A faith he suffered from, in part, his own doing. According to That's according to Amy Tarkanian, a political strategist and former chairwoman of the Nevada GOP. Here to discuss the speakership drama and how it might impact the 2024 presidential and congressional elections is Amy Tarkanian herself. Welcome, Amy. Thanks for having me. Hey, of course. So first, I want to ask you about this jockeying on Capitol Hill we're already seeing play out. House uh, Judiciary Committee Chairman Jim Jordan entered the race for speaker today. In addition to House current House Majority Leader Steve Scalise, there's some rumors that Kevin Hearn may be jumping in the race soon. He's been floated as a, as a, potential, as a potential candidate. From your point of view, who do you think would be best suited to leave the House, lead the House Republicans in their next chapter here? Sure. Well, there's uh, positives to 
either one of those gentlemen. However, if you want somebody who has more of an expertise, who already has staff ready to go on day one, that would be Steve Scalise. He's been in office, I believe, since 2008. Um, he's currently the number two Republican. And uh, despite his health concerns, uh, which seems to be uh, under wraps, thank thankfully, um, he seems to be the most prepared uh, to go immediately. And I know that there's major concerns of the government possibly shutting down. And so you would have somebody who literally would know what to do um, as soon as he took that role. I want to ask you specifically, that, that all makes sense. I want to ask you specifically about Jim Jordan. I, I find him to be a really interesting candidate because this entire Congress, in terms of the House Republican Conference, has been dominated by, by this, the right flank, right? We've been seeing the House conservatives sort of uh, lead a lot of the action, uh, push the conference more towards the right, more conservative. Jim Jordan is the founding chairman of the conservative House Freedom Caucus, he has those conservative bona fides that a lot of those members of the right flank, some of whom ended up voting to oust McCarthy, would very likely uh, welcome to the speakership. But do you think that he's maybe a little too conservative for this current House GOP conference, especially with, you know, just looking at the New York Republicans, they, a number of them in Biden districts, do you think that Jim Jordan would be, in terms of his, his ideology, his conservatism, would be too conservative for the conference or do you think it could work in this in this current moment well i don't even think the fact that it's that he's too conservative i think the fact that he's extremely outspoken and i think that right there in lies the problem so that way you don't have somebody who would be viewed more of uh neutral um and across the board as far as republicans uh, view for their issues and in what needs to be pushed forward. Um, the fact that he is one of the founders, as you just said, of the Freedom Caucus, I think right there would would cause pause for moderate Republicans to feel comfortable with him as the leader. The fact that uh, Jim also was one that spearheaded some of the conspiracy theories of the 2020 election being stolen. I think is also a major concern. So, you know, I, I do know that a number of uh, conservative Republicans would love to see him in that role, but I just don't see that happening if you need to have uh, a, a wide spectrum of Republicans, as you just mentioned, New York Republicans, Midwest Republicans. Um, I, I don't see that one happening. I also want to get to, of course, this news happened on Capitol Hill in the House, but it has, I think it could have real far-reaching implications on the political spectrum overall. So if we could talk a little bit about the 2024 presidential election, curious how you think, if at all, this speakership drama will affect 2024. Of course, former President Trump, a close ally of both McCarthy and Gates, though at times his relationship with McCarthy has been a little iffy. He, uh, Trump took a little time to throw his support behind McCarthy for the speakership, the first time back in January. And right now, former President Trump is being floated by a number of Republicans for to assume the speakership, potentially. Congressman Troy Nels, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Greg Stubbe, they've all said that they would support former President Trump to be the speaker. Of course, important to note, that's a massive long shot at this point. But curious to hear your take on how, if at all, uh, this speakership drama will affect the 2024 election. Sure. Well, first of all, that, that's not going to happen. You need to have a speaker who's going to be able to work across party lines, as we have just witnessed. It's very important that you're able to have open and honest discussions, trustworthy discussions with those, not just within your own party, but a, a, across the party aisle. And Donald Trump is not that person. Also, I've also seen um, on X, uh, the the rule 26 being floated where if you're somebody who's been convicted uh, for a felony, you are not allowed to uh, be in a leadership role. Um, and so that would exclude him immediately, uh, especially with everything that he's uh, under the microscope for. Uh, and so that's not going to happen. Um, I don't think it's going to affect the presidential race. I think that uh, people such as you and me, people who are politically astute, political nerds that pay attention to all of this, uh, more so the 
government essential workers who are concerned about the government shutting down. Those are the folks who are paying close attention to this. Your average voter who is just worried about getting their kids to school, uh, putting food on the table, that that's not their major concern at the moment. And so I think that this is going to be short lived. Hopefully um, we live in, in a society where, uh, you know, everything can change so quickly and uh, things are forgotten in the blink of an eye. And so I think your average voter probably isn't paying that close of attention right now. And then I want to ask you about the 2024 congressional races, because, of course, House Republicans took majority of the chamber back in 2022, a very slim majority, which is the reason why we're seeing a lot of uh, fierce fights on legislation, why McCarthy ultimately had to lower the threshold for the motion to vacate because that group of hardline conservatives had enough leverage to, to force him to make a change to assume the speakership the first time. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about your opinion on how, if how if so, again, this speakership drama will affect 2024. I actually asked the same question to former Speaker Kevin McCarthy last night, just minutes after he said he wouldn't run for the speakership again. I said, based on your fundraising prowess and just the, the current drama happening in the chamber, how do you see this affect affecting Republicans' ability to retain the majority in 2024. He brushed off the question, making a quip about Matt Gates fundraising for the NRCC. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of criticism of him fundraising off the motion to vacate. That all being said, though, I, will this make a dent at all in the 2024 congressional races? Um, unlike the presidential race, I do think that this will affect the congressional races. And the reason being is now the Democrats have more ammo to show the chaos uh, that ensues still within the Republican Party, unfortunately. So in the last election, when it was considered to be a red wave, they were able to capitalize off of the fear that Republicans would be taking away women's reproductive rights and also capitalize off the fact that you had extreme Republicans that were running. And so you heard that term uh, used over and over again. And so it, it, it works successfully. And I think that they're able to reuse those two issues once again but then now add even more fuel to the fire and show how Republicans in the House um, are not able to function uh, in a way that would be beneficial to the citizens um, of their districts. And so I do think that it's going to come back to haunt the Republicans, um, at least in the congressional races. All right. Amy Tarkanian, thank you so much for joining us, sharing your perspective. Some really, really interesting thoughts there. Thank you. And that'll do it for us today. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and follow The Hill everywhere you get your news. And tune into thehill.com for the latest in politics and policy. Have a great rest of the day.